And welcome back. Now, continuing with our love fest of all things radio wave and otherwise remote control communication, today we're going to look at this. Well, that really, but this as well, because the two are inextricably linked today. This is an RFID reader, and before I accidentally take any of these wires off here, because it's all a bit precarious at the moment, I want to show you something. So if we look at our code window, here we are. Now, RFID reader down here. In fact, I'm going to make that window just that little bit bigger so we can see what's going on. There we are. So, RFID reader, ID reader. This is an RFID fob, which came with it, as indeed did this card. So what happens in the debug window then when I go and touch the RFID reader? Well, watch the, watch the debug window. Whoa! It didn't like that one, did it? It said it was an alarm. Never mind, I've got another one to try it with, so let's try it with this one. Oh dear. Looks like I'm not authorised to do something and the alarm's been set off. Hang on though, I've got another one here, look. Oh look, that's me. And that's that's my work card on a on a bit of elasticated cord fob thing. I wonder if it'll let me in with this one. Ah, oh, thank goodness for that. I'm an authorised user. Well, it just goes to show how these RFID readers, which are in fact my fair classic readers, are found all over the place. I mean, I didn't know this was um, a my fair one. I just guessed from the shape of it. Um, and it lets me in. Well, it lets me into work as well, as it happens, which is just as well. So, putting that to one side for a minute, why didn't it let me in with these? Why is it saying alarm? Well, I've cheated, of course, and this, this bit of code that's coming out here, I've simply entered the um, four byte unique ID of each of these cards and said one of them is allowed and two of them aren't. We'll come on to that in just a second. Right, I needed to show you that first because that's where we're heading to. Now that I know I'm not going to disturb anything, or at least you've seen it before I disturb anything, let's get on with the actual how, what and why of this entire project. Right, here we are back at the workbench. Now, you've seen the results of this, or at least one possible result. I mean, there are lots of things you can do with an RFID. Although I do have one burning question, which we'll leave for a little bit later. So what's it all about, RFID readers? I mean, for a start, they're very, very cheap. I mean, you're talking a few dollars, a couple of pounds, three pounds mainly. Let's have a look on where I bought this one which is probably either Banggood, Gearbest, or somewhere on eBay in the Far East. So let's have a look at that first. So this is where I got it, and of course I was totally wrong. It wasn't the Far East, and it wasn't Banggood, and it wasn't Gearbest. In fact, it was a UK seller. Um, this one is in fact Scooterboy101. Um, I bought a few bits from this chap, and he's very good, very quick. So this is um, from uh, Scooterboy101. It's from the UK, £4.99. And, uh, there's, there's a little bit of information on here um, about what it is. Um, he says, I think he says he uses them as well. Yeah, he's personally used these, he says. Fine. Anyway, I still had to dig around for the um, documentation, but it wasn't very hard to find. Although I've got to say, RFID readers like this are fiddly, to say the least. And when I looked into the actual... Um, spec sheet of the actual board, um, I thought, good lord, this is going to take forever to do. Luckily, I found a library, which is quite mature. It's been around for a little while. Right, now this is from Miguel Balboa. This one here. <clears throat> now, the it does have quite a bit of information here, look. It even tells you exactly which pin to connect to which. So if you've got an Arduino, Uno, Mega, V3, Leonardo, Pro Micro, Teensy version here, it tells you which of the pins on the actual board, so on here, which, which of these pins go everywhere. Now, one of the things you've probably noticed straight away is there seems to be an awful lot of cables going on here. And yes, you're right. Why? Well, for one thing, this is um, SPI based, not I squared C, so that you need um, four or five cables for that alone. Plus you need the power. Um, 
and you need a reset. Um, so as you can see, I think you've got seven, is it seven cables there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven cables. Now that in alone's not not an issue. Seven cables from there to your Uno would be okay, but I've got this thing in the middle. Now, as I said on my previous video when this came up, this board here is a 3.3, Arduino is a five volt. So if you always connect this directly to here, kaboom, this would no longer function. Well, it might function for a bit and then it would go kaboom and that would be the end of it. You'd wonder what the hell's going on. So this thing in the middle is in fact a logic level shifter. You put all your five volt things in one side plus five volts and all the low voltage 3.3 volts and 3.3 volts as well in this side and this thing in the middle does its magic. So before we get onto this, let's just have a look at this because this could be an absolute lifesaver. I've seen on the forum um, resistor networks or just potential dividers generally to try and get the five volts down to 3.3. I don't know why people do that really when these are cheapest chips. This in fact is an eight port version. So you can have eight wires coming in and eight wires coming out, but more often you can get four port or four way uh, voltage converters, logic level converters, and they're even cheaper. So let's have a look on, I was going to say eBay where I bought it from, but I probably didn't now after all that. So let's just have a look. Well, it looks like eBay's playing up. Stand by, I'll be back soon. Right, here we are. I had to go to the back door, as it were, to try and find exactly where I got it from. But um, I bought this from uh, Lakey X 101 So this is the item itself. Nice big picture there. And as you can see, that's an eight-way. And it's 99 pence. Um, which is about, what, a dollar forty these days, if you're lucky. I've got at least one of those. So, 99 pence, as I say, and that's this little thing in the middle, and it just makes life so much easier. Apart from the wires when you're trying to put things on breadboard, but it'd be very easy to wire this up on a bit of um, strip board or something. So that's what that is then, a logic level shifter, 5 volt a board one side, 3.3 the other. Now having said all that, of course, if you looked at my last Wi-Fi video all about the ESP Duino and the Wemos D1, then you would have noticed that I'd mentioned a couple of times that it was a 3.3 volt board. So that, of course, could interface with this directly without the need for this, as could a Pro Micro, Arduino Pro Micro, or was it a Spark One Pro Micro? Whatever, the Pro Micro or indeed the Micro could do that. Any other board that's 3.3 volt based. But you do have to keep your wits about you a bit with the Arduino world. If you just pick up any old board and think, oh, I'll connect that to that today and see what happens. Well, a little puff of smoke or something and, well, you'll see what happens. It's a bit late then. Right, moving on then from the logic level converter, let's think about this reader and the fobs that go with it. Now, as I said, the, the actual reader um, uses a, a standard MyFair chip, and we can have a very quick look at that. And certainly you might want to look at the data sheet, but it starts getting quite complicated very quickly. It's a long data sheet, something like 60 odd pages. I'm thinking, hmm, when it gets that complicated, I'd rather let somebody else do the work. Uh, and these cards, now I've got a torch here, so I'm going to try and get the torch behind the card so you can see exactly what it is. Right, here we are. Um, now, if you look on the outside of that, I'm going to bring it nice and close. Look, if you look at the outside, there's the chip. And this bit on the outside now is just a coil of wire. And it goes all the way around a number of times. It's just, um, what do they call it, um, insulated copper wire or lacquered copper wire made in a big long loop going back to this chip. And if you look at the other one, this one here, this key fob, you can almost see the same in here. There, look. You get that blurry bit in the middle is the chip, and that other bit, that, that ring, is indeed the ring of copper wire. So these are passive, that is to say, they consume no electricity on their own. They're, well, excited, I think is the correct terminology to use. They're excited by this reader. So as you bring it close, the field that this is generating activates the chip in here just like the one in your credit card much the same well with one major difference you would hope that the chip in your credit card is secure from all and sundry as indeed the MyFair people thought this was secure against all and sundry but I think there were some Norwegian 
students who crack this and then just for the hell of it publish their findings on the internet so all right it would it would take more time than i've got left to actually decrypt and and crack the code used for this but of course there are people out there so it's not secure it shouldn't be viewed as secure but for general use it is i mean obviously my work fob uh, my work is very uh, well concerned with security so they're not going to give me one of these i think anybody can break in so it's secure enough for that um, so these are the two readers then coils or wire with a little chip let's think about what this is and what it's going to give you back because remember these fobs are read write and my fair classic fobs which these are can contain up to 1k of data let's have a look to see what we can do with that right here we are again and let's just bring the microphone down right now i've done a bit more digging about on how to write stuff to this card um, and with some success. Now, first of all, I looked at the um, the PDF here for this uh, MyFair Classic 1K. Now, the MyFair Classic is, doesn't just come in 1K, as it happens, there's 4K and another one. But the point is this data sheet, which I have here, is quite a few pages. Look, there's 39 pages, and I'm on page eight, and I was looking at the memory organization because it's organized in blocks and block zero, the very first bit, as it says down here, look, manufacturer's data. That's where your card ID is stored. Now, that's protected. You can't write to that. Or is it? Funnily enough, in the library that um, I've got here from Miguel Balboa, there's even a little sketch there to um, unbrick your card. So if you've done something silly with this card, which I'm desperately trying not to do, frankly, because I want to use this, um, you can run that sketch, which I must admit I haven't tried because I don't want to bugger this up, basically. Um, and it will actually overwrite the um, ID on this card. It will initialize everything, and it will put a, a new ID of 1234 on here. So I don't want to do that, but what I have discovered is how to at least write some data to it. So let's have a look at the code window, and we can play about with that for a little while. Right, here's the sketch then that uh, it's called personal data. This is all um, part of the, in the examples that's given to us in that library. Um, and as it says at the top, I believe, write personal data using blah, blah, blah. Fine. Let's upload this then and just see how easy it is to do. Um, I think I'll get everything right. Um, let's make sure I'm on the right port. COM5, yes, OK, let me move this window out of the way. We don't need that one so much. Right, let's upload that. And there it goes, right. So it's uh, verifying, done, yes. Good, right, let's look at the serial port. Right, so what it says here, right data on my fair pick. Right, off we go. So let's put the um, card in. There we are, so it's read the card and it says type in your family name. So I will, B-A-C-O-N hash, and do I click the send or send return? Let's just click the send button. Oh, it says success, now type in the first name, so Ralph, also with a hash, and send that. Success, success, and it's not actually showing me anything. Okay, let's take that away before it does anything nasty to it. So what it says is then, we've actually written some data to this now. Well, let's prove that. If we go back to our original sketch, this is the one that dumps all the data. So I'll just close that project up. Now this is RFID, so that's that one. Right, we'd have to upload this code again. It's a bit clunky, all this, but there are so many examples here. I guess this, is, this was the easiest way for him to do all this. So let's upload that. Right, so we're uploading RFID. It says it's done. Serial monitor. Yes, down here, look, it says scan the thing to see the details. So let's maximize this monitor and clear it because there's quite a bit of data to come out. So let's, off it goes, look. Now that personal data, I think it said somewhere in the sketch that it was writing it to one of the lower blocks. So what I'm expecting in here now 
and I can make this window a little bit smaller so that it actually makes the font a bit bigger. Right, so if we scroll down to the bottom, whoops, let me just do this quickly. Right, so we've scrolled down to the bottom. Here's our card ID down here, which is in the protected area. In fact, I think this, this entire block here is protected. But our data, I think it said it was going to put it in block one, so it could be mm, in there. Well, rather than faff about looking at the hex values, what I've got, or what I found on the internet, was a rather useful little website. It's called ascii2hex.com. So I'm looking for the word Ralph somewhere, aren't I? So if I type in Ralph, convert. So here's the hexadecimal representation of that. So we're looking for 52, 61, 6C, and so on. Fine, let's find that in our code window. So 52, 61, 6C. Oh, look, there we are. It's already there. Um, is that, in, the, in fact, the entire bit? 7068. Right, OK, so there's my name. Plain text, though. So what I mean about encryption? I'll come on to that in just a sec. So that says Ralph. Now, you'd expect somewhere also for it to say Bacon, and it's not written as part of block 2, as far as, far as I can see. So let's just see where it could be written. It could be written here, I suppose. Well, let's have a look. So if I go back to the browser window, so somewhere we're expecting the word bacon, whatever that looks like in hex. Convert that, please. And it says 42, 61, 63, all this gubbins here. So back to the code window. So looking for 42, 61, 63. Oh, look. Look at this here, look. Right down the bottom. 42, 61, 63, 6E. That was correct, wasn't it? Yes, it was. So it's written my, my surname there. Was it my surname? Yes. And my first name there. In that bit. Now... I said yesterday this wasn't um, any, a difficult card to crack. Well, if you're a cracker, not me. But, um, but writing it, of course, in plain text means that if I were a company now, um, a business company that gave these out to employees with personal data on them, and they were lost in some way, then it would be all too easy to extract that information, isn't it? So really, we're after some kind of encryption. Now, I did look into this. And the encryption mechanism. It says that um, it does encrypt it, actually, even when it writes it. But the keys that come with this card that are built into here are FF, 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 all the way along. I think it's uh, an 8-byte eight, eight card. I think it might even be... Not quite sure where the key's stored now. It was mentioned in the data sheet. So if we go back here, somewhere in here it mentions about where the encryption key is sorted, but it all got a bit too convoluted for um, hobbyists, to be quite honest, and I wasn't prepared to muck about and screw up my card. So what it's saying is you can encrypt it, but how you change the encryption keys, I'm not too sure. And would you, if it was encrypted properly, fine. You've got far less chance of somebody just swiping it as we've done. Um, but the... The values, of course, are very easy to read using a simple reader like this for a few dollars. So I'm not going to I'm not going to play about with that because I've got I've got this nagging suspicion that if I play about too much now, one, it's not really giving you the viewer too much value because if you if you've already got this far and you go yes, I need to encrypt it. Well, I've given you a link to the the PDF that tells you everything you need to know, all 39 pages of it. So good luck with that one and how to read the data and everything else. I think you can probably take it forward in there, but I don't want to muck up this card because I want to use it, nor this fob. Um, because uh, although these, these PIC cards, did I tell you that PIC stands for Proximacy Integrated Circuit Card, by the way? So even though this is a card and this is a fob, it's still a PIC fob, I guess. Um, I don't want to screw them up because I do want to find a proper use for this. Um, now, the top five uses, of course, for these cards are in order. Number one, that's number one, 
um, door entry systems, of course, as in fact I have at my place of employment. I have to use my card to get in the door, in fact, every door in the building. And for that, it doesn't really need any personal information on here, does it? All it needs is the ID. You have the ID. Nobody knows whose card this is or where it's used for. Okay, that's number one. Number two. Yeah, that's where I stopped really. What else do you use these cards and dongles for? Well, one use that I figured I could do is to unlock my machine, my PC that is. Um, I could fairly easily, um, let me just show you this other project, we see that one there. This is my video switcher module and when I touch this uh, it sends commands down to my PC just as though I typed them here on the keyboard, exactly the same, no different. Um, because it uses uh, uh, SparkFun Pro Micro that emulates a keyboard. So I reckon I could fairly easily make one of these so that when I swiped this, it would send out a control or delete to get to the logon password and then send my password down. That said, I don't think I want my password unencrypted on here. And of course, then you've got to write it back. So you'd need a different mechanism to write this back. So you'd have to get the value in here or to here, possibly by the serial port, but it all gets a little bit clunky then, doesn't it? But I'm sure there's scope for a project there to swipe on and off your computer in a secure manner. Okay, that's number two. Number three, I'm really struggling now. I can't think of any other use for the key fobs in this to, to unlock or to allow access to anything. So if you know, please, please put it in the comments below this video and tell me what you use or think you might use or have seen these used for. Because I think it would help everybody watching this video and just generally um, who if anybody was thinking of using RFIDs. It sounds like such a great little system, doesn't it? It's so cheap and easy to do. You think, why, why aren't there more uses for them? I don't know. Right, we're going to leave it there. I think we've um, covered the sort of basics, how to read data, how to write data to it. Um, the fact we've got a, a level shifter in here was just sort of an added bonus to get that out of the way. And as I say, if you use a board that has a 3.3 volt pin level anyway, you don't need this logic level shifter. You can just wire it up directly to here, but don't, please don't wire this up directly to a five volt board. Like you know, you do need this shifter. Okay, that's where we're going to leave it. When I do come up with a project for this and this, and I'm really, really thinking hard, if I can get the encryption done right, I'm then going to use this to unlock my PC. And that will be another project for a future day. But in the meantime, thanks for watching. I hope you're finding these videos interesting and useful. You can leave comments down below and also click that little button that says subscribe. Okay, thanks for watching and see you in the next video.